Hello, my name is Florian Wenzel. I'm from Google Brain in Berlin, and I'm very excited to talk about our work, How Good is the Base Posterior in Deep Neural Networks Really? This is joint work with two other joint authors, Kevin Roth and Bas Wehling, and the other amazing colleagues listed here. Today, I want to talk about Bayesian Deep Learning. So the goal is to enable Bayesian inference for deep networks to improve robustness of predictions. And it's a very active research field where most work focuses on improving um, approximate inference techniques to get closer to the base posterior. So in the last years, um, there were many amazing papers covering this topic. Today, I want to ask a different question. Is the base posterior actually good? So what is the base posterior in deep nets? Um, let's start with a standard neural network. So here we typically parameterize uh, a likelihood function by some parameter theta given by a deep net. So for example, for classification, we would use a categorical likelihood uh, given by a softmax. And so for different thetas, we would obtain different models. In a Bayesian neural network, however, we consider a distribution over all those parameters and then we are interested in the posterior, which is the, dis um, the distribution over all likely models given the data. How do we do predictions? So in standard deep learning, we optimize um, a loss, which is the um, log posterior given by the log likelihood term and a regularizer term. And then we obtain a single point estimate. In a base in deep learning, uh, we sample from the posterior uh, which can be considered as an ensemble of models. And then we can use those samples to um, compute the predictive distribution, which can be viewed as an average over um, different models. So and in this talk, we are interested in models that predict well. So we, for example, if uh, we can see that if they have low cost entropy. <clears throat> so. There are many amazing promises coming with Bayesian neural networks. So because we average over multiple models, we expect BNNs to be more robust in generalization. Second, we um, expect that BNNs lead to better uncertainty estimates. So uh, those models know when they don't know. And finally, we are promised that BNNs are better suited for new deep learning applications like continual learning or sequential decision making. But despite those nice promises, BNNs are rarely used in practice. Why is that? What is the problem with BNNs? So in practice, uh, the predictions of a BNN are often even worse than uh, um, the performance of SGD. So, but there is some hope you can actually um, improve uh, base predictions by using what we call the cold posterior. So the cold posterior um, is the base standard posterior with an additional temperature parameter t. So for t equal one, you get back the original posterior, but for t less than one, uh, we sharpen the posterior, which can be interpreted as overcounting the ev evidence. And such cold posteriors are used by most recently based in deep learning paper. Um, so let's see how this looks in practice. So as you can see, when we decrease the temperature, the uh, probability mass becomes more concentrated at the modes. And in practice, this works quite well. So in the top plot, we consider a ResNet 20 architecture on Cypher 10. And then we train BNNs for different temperatures and plot the final test performance as function of temperature. You can see that the true base posterior for temperature one, uh, so yeah, for temperature one uh, performs worse than the baseline given by SGD. But we can improve the performance by decreasing the temperature. And the same holds for a different architecture, a CNN LSTM on the IMDB data set. Uh, for temperature one, we are again worse than the baseline, but we can improve if we decrease the temperature. And in both settings, the optimal temperature is clearly less than one. So this works well in practice, but still we think there is a big problem. 
because cold posteriors sharply deviate from the Bayesian paradigm. And in our opinion, this points to a fundamental problem, which we think is important to explore if we want to make further progress in Bayesian deep learning. Um, so what is the use of better inference methods if the actual posterior is poor? In our paper, we study um, different hypotheses for the cold posterior effect. So we look at potential problems with the inference method. And then since uh, in modern deep neural network architectures, we use techniques like batch normalization, dropout or data augmentation, which lead to a not formal likelihood function. So maybe this causes problems. And we also look into potential problems with the prior. To give you a spoiler, in the paper we find that uh, most likely uh, problems with the prior are linked to the cold posterior effect. In this talk, I can not um, cover all the details, so I will concentrate on three hypotheses. First, I will talk about inference and then discuss the prior. So inference, is it accurate enough? First, uh, what do we use for inference in this paper we um, use stochastic gradient Markov chain Monte Carlo methods because they typically perform best among all scalable inference methods. Um, uh, I will, will first uh, give you some background on SGMCMC and then discuss if problems with that inference technique could lead to the po cold posterior effect. So let's start with SGD, stochastic gradient descent. Here we just optimize <coughs> a loss function and then we get a single point estimate in the end. In SGMCMC, however, we converge in distribution to the posterior. So if we collect some samples um, in the SGMCMC scheme along the trajectory, uh, we know that those samples will asymptotically come from the true posterior. So how does it work? Um, I don't want to go into the details. So here's just a one slide refresher on Longevong dynamics, which are the core of SGMCMC. So Longevong dynamics are governed by a stochastic differential equation of the parameter theta and the momentum vector m. And we know that simulating this SDE leads to a stationary distribution, which is proportional to the tempered posterior. All right, uh, and to solve this SDE, we consider a discretization scheme, in this case, symplectic Euler. And this is actually just um, one part which resembles SGD with momentum. And then we have an additional part, which is just in a Gaussian noise scaled by the temperature. And if we um, execute the scheme, we get approximate samples from the posterior. But since uh, the discretization and mini batch noise can lead to error, we ask, is this actually accurate enough? <clears throat> so this is a, a really hard question to assess the quality of the samples obtained by SGMCMC in general. Uh, in our paper, we propose some um, diagnostics. For example, here we plot the distribution of the kinetic temperatures of each um, parameter, and then we test if they are in a 99th probability uh, sampling in the wall. And if most of those diagnostics check out, then we know, okay, uh, probably everything works fine. And on the other hand, like in this plot, where most, or like yeah, more than half of those diagnostics don't check out, we know that there's a potential problem with the sampling algorithm. In a more simplified setting, we can actually access the accuracy of SGMCMC more directly. So here we generate synthetic data from an MLP. And then we use the same MLP to fit a base posterior on the data. Uh, on the left side, we consider Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, which can be viewed as the gold standard. And we make sure uh, using many different diagnostics that this actually produces samples which are really close to the ground truth. So samples from the true base posterior. Um, so we, we um, fit the base posterior 
of an MLP of different depths from of one to three. And then we plot the final test performance as function of temperature. On the right side, you can see the performance of the same models, but in this case using SGMCMC. And you can see that both plots look quite similar and only for small temperatures, SGMCMC deviates a little bit from the crown truth. And these experiments and some others in the paper give us some confidence that SGMCMC actually works well enough and potential problems with the inference method cannot alone explain the cold posterior effect. Okay, so let's look at this plot again. There's actually something else interesting to read off this plot. Um, we can see that actually uh, in this plot, temperature one performs best. And this is because the model is well specified. But for real world data, as we saw in the beginning, temperatures less than one are better. So maybe there is a problem with um, misspecification of the model. So just to wrap up, inference uh, problems with the inference method couldn't explain the cold posterior effect. So now we look at potential problems with the prior. In most <clears throat> Bayesian deep learning work, we use just the standard Gaussian prior on the parameters. So let's see if this is actually a good prior. And one way to, to assess this is to look at the induced predictive distribution. So for one trial from the prior, we can look at the distribution of class probabilities over um, um, a, a data set distribution P of X. And then for each draw from the prior, we would get a different distribution of class probabilities. And then we can see if this um, matches our beliefs about how the data is um, distributed. So let's see how it looks for our ResNet 20 on Cypher 10. So we do that and we sample from the prior and look at the induced predictive distributions. And as you can see, um, each network drawn from the prior essentially maps all images just to one class. And this is clearly problematic as, is, as it surely um, doesn't uh, represent our beliefs about the data. So maybe there's an easy fix for that by just changing the variance of the Gaussian prior. Um, so you can improve the predictive distribution a little bit, such it becomes a little bit more uniform. But still, we can see for all variances we considered that the cold posterior effect is still present, as um, in all cases, temperatures less than one perform best. And there's another interesting observation we made that the cold posterior effect becomes stronger with increasing capacity. So here we considered an MLP on Cypher 10 again. And in the left plot, we used an MLP with fixed depth of three, so three hidden layers. And then we varied the width of the network, so the number of layers, uh, neurons per layer. And as you can see, with increasing uh, width of the network, um, the optimal temperature becomes lower. Um, and we see a similar tendency um, by the depth of the network. So here we fix the width to 128. And the deeper the model com becomes, the more pronounced the cold posterior effect. So let me summarize here. We find that potential problems with the inference methods cannot explain the cold posterior effect. Um, on the other side, we find that you can uh, make B and M's work by considering cold posteriors, and you can actually obtain state-of-the-art results. However, we argue that this still points to a fundamental problem, which is important to um, explore. In our paper, we didn't get an inclusive. Uh, sorry, in our paper, we didn't get a conclusive answer on the question of the origin of the cold posterior effect, but we think. More work on understanding is important, and especially we need to think more carefully about appropriate priors. You can find the code on our GitHub repository, and I'm looking forward to your questions in the QA session or via email. Thank you for your attention.